Hello and welcome to Cornish Walking Trails. Today we're on the trail of St Perrin. in the 6th century is meant to have landed on Perrinpool's beach and we're going to explore the dunes to find his church, his oratory and there is now a modern day cross that marks the site of the oratory for people to find it. After that we're going to walk along the coastal path back to Perrinpool. <coughs> walk today is taken from really short walks St Ives to Padstow. It's walk number 9, Perrin Beach. Perrin Beach is on the north coast of Cornwall near Perrinpools. So thank you for clicking on our video. If you clicked on our video because you're interested in finding out more about Cornwall and walks that you could do if you came to explore Cornwall for yourselves, then our channel should be perfect for you. So please consider subscribing. It's free on YouTube and it really helps us out. Enjoy our video. So our walk today starts from a long lay-by on a minor road running north towards Mount from the B3285 Perrinporth Goonhaven Road. The dunes are a great place to bring a dog, but today we've decided not to. Firstly, it's going to be really hot, and secondly, if it's hot, the adders come out, and we don't want our little doggy bitten, and so it's easier if he stays at home today. We're near Perrinporth today, and ahead of me, but behind all this tall cow parsley, we can see Perrin Sand, so we're in the dunes. Is it east of Perrinporth? Uh, Newquay side of yeah, Perrinporth. Side, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love days like these, Sarah. Why's that? Well, beautiful sunshine in it, middle of yeah. July. Yeah. Do you know what I particularly like today? No. Free parking. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Park on the on the road on in a lay by, don't we? We do. I might even spoil myself at the end of this walk and get an ice cream in Perrinporth. Oh yeah. Come on then. <laughs> If you ever find yourself walking through the dunes at Perrinporth and you're not quite sure where you're going, there are lots and lots of paths, lots of desire paths and of course the locals create their own paths with their dog walking. But helpfully to get to the oratory area, which is where we're headed today, there's lots of white markers. We'll show you one here in a minute. There's one over, just over here. There's another one. These are good, aren't they? Yeah! I remember we used to bring the kids up here, didn't we? They're great <laughs> yeah. fun trying to find these. But they're actually a very ancient form of sat-nav. Oh, are they? Yeah, they were painted with this emulsion paint before the times of books. Right. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I always think of the dunes as raw and desolate. It's quite a harsh landscape in the winter, but in the summer, so much colour. There's all these beautiful little purple flowers. And I'm not 100% sure if they're thyme or heather. And then you've got so many contrasting yellows with it. It just looks as though it's a patchwork, a tapestry it's of colour. It's a beautiful colour, colour co uh, combination, isn't it? Purple with the yellow. Yeah, yeah. Very pleasing on the eye. Colour theory, of course, is that you've got blue and red makes purple, and then you have your opposite primary of yellow. So in colour theory, that's why we like it. Is that why it works? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just delicately trying to find a few little footsteps that I can take without damaging the plants and without falling down a bunny hole. But what I want to do is to find out if this is heather or thyme. Now thyme obviously is a herb and if I gently bruise its leaves, rub its leaves, it should give off a fragrance. So shall we find out? If we pinch it. You can't pinch it. You've got to leave it here. <laughs> it's thyme. It smells of thyme. Yes, this is thyme populating the dunes. Isn't it so pretty, butterfly? And then you get that added benefit of the hum of the bumblebees and the butterflies are fluttering around as well. It just makes the dunes feel so warm and welcoming at this time of year. This area, Perrin Porth, Perrin Sands, lots of Perrins. There is, isn't there? Why is that, Sarah? <laughs> it's, it's to do with the patron saint of Cornwall, St Pirren who is reported, or it's a myth, isn't it, that he came over from Ireland. There's 
several accounts of this myth. One is that he fell out with the chieftains and he was preaching Christianity over there. They didn't like it and undermined them and they, they threw him out of Ireland on a millstone and he floated to Cornwall. And that's when he started to spread Christianity in Cornwall and set up the oratory. So we're looking at the 6th century, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> That seems incredible to me. So that's like, we're, we're now 2021, 20, that's yeah. 1500 years ago. Yeah. But he's a patron saint of Cornwall and we celebrate St Piran's Day every In March. March. Yes. Yeah, it's mad, it's bonkers. And that, that's held here, isn't it? Yeah, and there's a procession down to the oratory and the St Piran's Cross and comes across the dunes. Yeah. If you ever have... find yourself in Cornwall in March, it's well worth coming along and having a watch. It's 20,000 Really important thing that St Pyrrhon was attributed with was teaching the Cornish miners how to smelt the tin ore and he's said to have developed the Cornish flag by getting white tin to make the cross on a piece of black rock. I love that story, I think it's such a romantic kind of story. So there are lots of paths on the dunes, which is what we've already discussed, and we're following the one suggested by the book with the white markers. At this point, we can see the cross indicating the oratory on top of the dunes, but there's also an older cross, the Celtic cross, from 900 AD, I think, and we're gonna go and visit that now. So we're gonna take a little detour up to the right to visit the old cross and church. A thousand years of history. So apparently there used to be an inscription, they believe, but the sand has eroded that, the abrasive quality of the sand. But I've got a problem with it. Look, they didn't do finish the fourth hole. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> oh, I've done three. I'm so tired. Do I have to do a fourth? You don't get your pass, do you, till you do the fourth? Oh, it's taken me ages to do that. <laughs> I'm bored. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Feels nice. Do you think? I do, I do. It's, it does feel slightly smooth. Right. Because I think of the effects of sand. Um, you know, I'm thinking of doing cross reviews. <laughs> <laughs> what would you give this one then? Well, to be honest with you, I like the, I like the way you have the lichen. You have this yellow lichen on this side. Golden lichen. Golden lichen. You have a, like a, a greeny coloured one on the other side. Yeah. It's very tall. It's over eight foot tall. Points for being to tall. believe, because I'm very tall. I do like the fact they've got the holes in it. They've obviously made yeah. an effort with it. But they haven't finished the job. No, I know, but it adds to, it makes a nicer story, I think. Okay. Yeah. And um, it's been here a long time. It's over a thousand years, but I think yeah. you've already said that, haven't you? Yeah. Um, it does all the right things that a cross should do. Okay, so what's its score? Well, I think it's right up there. I think it's got to be a 10 out of 10. Oh, so you're not going to make it angry then? No. Cross, angry. Oh. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> that went right over your head, didn't it? Didn't it? <laughs> Before we leave this majestic cross, Sarah. Yes. I'm going to put you on the spot now, your Cornish knowledge. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the three holes in the cross. Yes. Is that unique? No. Ooh. No, there is said to be another one in Weybridge at Egloss Hale Church. But I can't remember seeing it out there, can you? I know we've visited up there a few times, but yeah, I can't remember the cross and there only being three holes. So perhaps I wasn't thinking about it at is the time. Is that the church with the infamous haunted bunny? Yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah. do we make a video about that? Yeah. Can we leave a link to yeah. it at the end? Yeah. Okay. What are you doing? Mr. Rabbit! Mr. Rabbit! You're calling a rabbit? Yeah. Why? Couldn't I be hungry. Oh, mad! Just adjacent to that cross that we were looking at a minute ago is this. It's the church, the second church dedicated to St. Pyrrhon, believed to date back to about the 12th century, something like that. And over time, sand has filled it and it's been excavated. Wow, so that looks like the pedestal for a column of some sort. And this part of the building is smaller. And this is what they believed was the tower. 
all those years ago. That is impressive, isn't it, really? Very thick walls. What I like as well, if you come over here, right, you can actually see where the old plaster was on the walls. And oh my walls goodness, there. mate. Are you sure? Or is that just a modern day preservation I don't know. idea? It carries on all the way along. Yeah, true. But you go into a lot of the churches and the walls are white, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, lime wash. Oh, it might be a lime wash. can see like modern attempts to stabilise it. It does make you wonder how long this will be here in the sand dunes before it gets buried again. Do you have a favourite feature of this church? I like the mullion window, or what remains of it. A lot of information on here but it talks about the relics of St Piran on here. Oh, okay. So it actually says it says throughout the Middle Ages the church possessed many relics of St Piran which on occasions were paraded around Cornwall. It says these include a relic bound with iron holding St Piran's skull, a cross of St Piran made of bone and a mm. shrine which held the body of the saint. Oh. So it makes you wonder where did all these things go? Let's head down to the oratory now. It's closer to the sea and used to get buried more frequently. Always think as you approach the oratory, it's a little bit disappointing. You could be forgiven for thinking it's a concrete bunker, something to do with the wars maybe, but it isn't. It's actually deliberate. It was an Edwardian attempt to shield the oratory for a long time it was under a bunker a concrete bunker then they decided to move half that bunker but they've left half of it in place making it look like this warlike structure <laughs> it is most bizarre that, that gate's not going anywhere is it oh no it's full of water oh You've got this modern buttressing supporting the old walls, what's left of them anyway. It goes all the way around, I guess that's to stabilise it. And at this end, that presumably is the altar. By all accounts, the skeleton of St Pyrrhon was buried under the altar. It's a bit of a shame, isn't it? I can't get in there today. It has been a very wet June, but I wasn't expecting it to be knee-deep in green water. Oh, okay. So that's the outside of the oratory. Let's go a bit further if we can. It's quite muddy. Oh. So on the left is this concrete bunker structure built in the Edwardian era. And aren't the old walls so wonky? Such a contrast to the newer, more modern straight wall. In some respects, it does make you wonder if the sand protected this old structure from decaying any further. It would have been very static in the sand. There we go, look. <laughs> it's very muddy today. <laughs> oh gosh, it's muddy. Ah, touching both walls. There's a lot of evidence of decisions made in the past, good or bad, when they decided to entomb it. Then they decided to take half of it down, but they've, they've obviously made that decision with the thought of keeping the sand 
away from the old building. Yeah, so they did in Victorian times, in the 1830s and the 1840s, they did the excavations here. And in, I think, as you said, this went in in the early part of the 20th century, didn't it? Yeah. This concrete thing. But it's actually kind of worked, isn't it? Because all the sand is outside. The old, well, it's, it's the newer concrete bit, doesn't it? It actually yeah. does protect the old wall. But there's also evidence that this area is well worn, isn't it? It's got a lot of footfalls, so there's no grass, so the sand is more movement around it, hasn't it? And it, it's banked up against the walls, hence we're higher yeah. than the oratory itself. So I think in the winter time as well, it quite often floods around here, around the yeah, entrance as well. That's, so. that's the other thing, hasn't it? I was going to go on to say, that's led to it being the lowest yeah. point and where the water gathers, so is that going to damage it now? So what are they going to have to do now? Mm. It's interesting, isn't it, to see the passage of time and man's attempts to protect it, but have they worked? There's a, an old, old, <laughs> that's old as the archery. 2006 this notice board was put in, so it's a bit weather-worn. And it does give the most fantastic history of the oratory. I think it tells us here that it was approximately 9 metres by 5 metres. And it, it does give an account of the decisions made to try to protect the structure. So the sand was encroaching on the building structure and moving the walls. So that's why they decided to put this uh, concrete structure up. And it tells me here that um, it was likened to a reservoir, a motor garage, an aerodrome, quite appropriate with the plane going over, a picture palace, anything except a church. It was protected due to the fact that people were coming here, there was a lot of people interested. The tourism it attracted meant that people were taking sand from here, destabilising the building, vandalising it, so they felt they had to protect it at that time. And then it goes on to say, there's actually skeletons buried near and around the oratory and as the sand moves sometimes they appear. A woman with a child in her arms appeared near the doorway in 1910 which then brings it back to the human factor doesn't it that this was actually a church and people came here worshipped God and and had a faith. The final thing, the third thing on our trail of St Pyrrhon is to go up to the cross that they put in. It's simply, I think, to let you know where the oratory was. So it's a big tall concrete cross on a high dune. You chose the steep route. I, I have chosen the wrong route. <laughs> you took the easy route. I did, the gentle route. In this heat, you don't want to be doing any exertion. So is that concrete then? Mmm. It's actually strangely effective. From our library, <laughs> we've brought with us this book. It is the Cornwall Village book and it was put together by the WI. What I like about this book is that they've brought all of the local knowledge together and there's a really brilliant paragraph in here about Perrinporth. Legend has it, buried beneath the sand dunes is a city of Langaro. Its people, rich from mining copper and tin, became too high and mighty to work, so they imported England's worst criminals to do the job for them. Gradually, these workers infiltrated into the city which became a den of iniquity, corruption, and it degraded. One night, a wind came swirling down, driving the sand before it. For three days and nights it blew, and the wonderful city was buried. The thought of that, that there's a city somewhere here in the sand dunes. <laughs> Incredible. Should have brought a dog, really, isn't it? He would have dug it up. He would have done, yeah. yeah. He's good at that. He's good at digging in sand. Yeah. Cut to clip a dog digging in sand. Dig, 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 dig. <laughs> We've got to get there next. It's that beautiful three mile stretch of golden sand. Oh, that looks nice. Doesn't it? Facing the oratory, turn left, which is west. So the oratory's over there. So we're going to be going west, which is where my f I've run out of fingers. Well, how many fingers do you need? <laughs> Go on, keep going, you're a professional. We're going that way. Right. We're, we're that going... doesn't work on camera. Right. No. Okay. Okay. We're going that right. way. Right, oratory, turn left. Yeah. Right. No left.
Just as you leave the oratory, you'll notice this fence and a danger sign. It's actually Ministry of Defence land on the other side, but it's a good landmark because if you follow it, eventually it will take you to the sea. Come on then. Well, thank you, fair maiden. <laughs> So is this going to conclude our segment where we're talking about St Pirin then, Sarah? Possibly, although Perrin Porth oh, is okay. named after St Pirin, isn't it? Well, be before we do wrap it up talking about St Pirin, there was one really important thing I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, what was that? Well, he obviously had a dilemma, didn't he? Because he was supposed to be a very, very tall man. Yes. So where did he buy his clothes? I don't know. Well, I've got an idea. <laughs> okay. I know, but in Red Roof, years ago, there was a shop at the top of Red Roof and it was called the Big Man Shop. And I think that's where he bought his clothes. Not the Tall Man Shop. It was called the Tall Man Shop and it was at the top of Red Roof. And if we can find a Google image and we'll include it here now. Anyway, the next question is, where did he buy his shoes? Oh, no. And his pants. And did he have outsized pasties? Well, he'd have to, wouldn't he? If he had, if he's a tall man, he had big hands. He'd have big hands to eat his yeah, big Yeah, because otherwise, with. Have you heard this recently, no, right? What? When we were kids, a little pasty was called a cocktail pasty. It was, yeah. Now they're calling it pixie pasty. Well, that's just wrong. So would a normal pasty look like a pixie pasty in St Pirin's hands? That's a tongue twister. <laughs> it's a tongue twister, very good. I enjoyed that. <laughs> The instructions in the book are very simple. They tell us to pick up the southwest coast path and head back towards Perrinporth. So the beach will be on our right and there's lots of paths heading towards the sand dunes. So as long as we're running parallel with the sea, we should get there. Is this the perfect lunch spot? Gorgeous, gorgeous views up and down the coast. You beat me to it! I'm hungry. They won't stay still. It's nature. And talking of nature. You need a wee, do you? <laughs> no! No? Oh, right, yeah, okay, gone. Nature has pulled a blinder of a day on us. Yeah. And although the walk instructions tell us to follow the southwest coast path across the dunes, how do you feel about trying to scramble down and just paddle back to Perrinport in the sea? Wow, that sounds nice. Well, it we know the tide's on its way out. 9.29 was high tide, so we're safe. We should get through at that narrow point. So let's, let's try and scramble down, shall we? Yeah, give that a go. Cool. I'll try not to fall on you, all right? <laughs> Sarah? Yeah? You having fun? Yeah. <laughs> I managed to get some shoe in my sand. <laughs> Take them off. All right. Ready? Yeah. Are you intending to walk through Perrinport like that? Yeah. <laughs> Can I walk on the other side of the street? Oh, what's that? Jellyfish. Jellyfish? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no.
beach is off at high tide. We know the tide went out, or it reached its high tide point at half past nine this morning, two or three hours ago. So the tide is on the way out and it will be safe for us to continue around the headland. So the southwest coast path comes down those steps that the people are currently climbing and skirts around the back of the beach. That's exactly what we're going to do. So I guess this is the point where we could detour into town. Yeah, so our walk eventually is going to take us back to the left and up some steps and back to where we parked the car. Yeah. We're in Perrinpool. Should we go and have a look around Perrinpool? Yeah. In. Right, I'm masked up, I'm going in. <laughs> I'm on a mission. <laughs> Mint chop chip, please. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> Very Cheers. nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Going to join the main road that goes from Perrinpools to Newquay and we know where the exit from the beach is on the corner so we're going to not retrace our steps but pick up the walk from the corner. I hope you're following this at home. Yeah. yeah I don't want to get lost again Sarah. <laughs> We're on Perrinporth Golf Course now and there is a permissive route across here so we're following the white markers across the golf course. Which way do you think they're playing? Uh, well they're playing, they tee off there I think on the right so they must be going that way. Right to left? Yeah. just taken like a triangular diversion and it's I guess for safety reasons there's a quite fast road there and there's a blind bend at the entrance to Perrin Sands Holiday Park so it's a safer route and it does avoid walking on the road so thumbs up for that oh, we are back where we started back to the pull-ins where we first parked up I walked today on the trail of St Piran, who came over from Ireland floating on a millstone. Of course he did, yeah. Three and three quarter miles, we went and found the oratory. Yes, all the, all the paths in the dunes, they're quite easy to follow. Then we went out to the coast, paddled in the sea. Yeah, got my feet wet, it was lovely. It was, I adored it. It's been a fantastic day to do this walk. The instructions worked, the map was pretty good. Nothing went wrong. No, three and three quarter mile walk. Enjoyed it. So what are you going to score it? Uh, 9 out of 10 for me. Yeah, I think a 9 is fair. 